John chapter 20, we'll start with verse 11, and we'll read down to verse 18. Grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Join me there. Verse 11. <clears throat> but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher, Jesus said to her, do not cling to me for I have not yet ascended to the Father but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Join me as we pray. <clears throat> father, I pray for every heart, every heart, even hard hearts here, that you would break through. Father, I pray for every life filled with resentment or bitterness or pain that you today would break through. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the resurrection. And Father, I pray that you would call. Call the people and give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> In the early 1800s, after the Napoleonic Wars were over, it is said that England mastered the seas, even giving rise to the phrase, rule Britannia. From the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific to the Indian Ocean to the Mediterranean Sea, all points in between, the British Empire was safeguarded by ships of the line. These were impressive frigates with their multi-tiered majestic decks, the beautiful sails you could see over on the sunrise, with cannons sticking out either side, bronze cannons. These ships of the line would be manned by brilliant sea captains with eagle-eyed vision and nose for war. But there's more to it than just the romanticism of seeing one of these clipper-type ships. There's something else that kept those ships steady on the waves and and kept them standing up right in the worst storms. What you wouldn't see was way down deep in the belly of the hole was something called ballast. Ballast. Ballast, if you look it up, will be piles of rock or gravel or sand or stone or bricks. That ballast would be loaded into the hull of the ship so that the ship would sink down into the water just enough to be balanced and standing upright in the middle of a storm. Now, now we don't think much about what's below the surface until the weather changes until you find yourself in the raging storm of heartbreak, or you find yourself in the raging pain of death, you find yourself in the soul-crushing anxiety, 
When that happens, when that storm hits your life, what's up on deck, what everybody sees doesn't really matter. It's what's deep inside your soul that matters. And if you don't have the ballast of the crucified, resurrected Jesus deep in your soul, then the storm you go into, or, or you know what, we're all in it, the societal, we're in a mess, the societal storm that you go into with your children will end up sinking you to the bottom. Today, what I want to do is just one thing. I just want to, I just want to load it up. I just, want to, I just want to offer some ballast to your life. I want to give you from the Bible grace and, 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 and hope for your soul that will be found in the person of Jesus Christ. And it's found in this beautiful story that we just read. I love this passage. I love the Gospel of John, and I love this passage. Now, since we do expositional preaching, which is going paragraph by paragraph, and we've sort of dropped into this, let's do a little uh, catching up to John chapter 20. If you read the story in the Gospel of John, according to the Gospel of John, Jesus is crucified between two thieves. Right here in John chapter 20, he is raised between two angels. In John chapter 19, the body of Jesus is taken down off the cross after he breathes his last. A rich man named Joseph of Arimathea, who was a secret follower of Jesus, comes there to get the body of Jesus. Another man named Nicodemus, who visited Jesus at night because he too was a secret follower of Jesus. They took the body of Jesus together and they put it in a new garden tomb. The other Gospels tell us that the tomb was sealed. Soldiers were put outside. Chapter 20 opens up in verse 1. Chapter 20 gives us three characters, three main characters. A man named John who wrote the Gospel of John. A man named Peter who's a famous apostle. And an unlikely woman named Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene is the one in verse 1, chapter 20, verse 1. She's the one that went to the tomb while it was still dark, when morning had not yet broken. She looked inside the tomb and she, or she didn't even look inside the tomb yet, she saw the stone was removed and she ran and got the men, Peter and John, and told them, hey, they have taken the body of Jesus. Well, John, John wrote the gospel. John and Peter start running. Here's the way John tells it. Me and Peter took off running. I was younger and in better shape, and I got there first. <laughs> Go back and read it. That's his, that's his way of saying I beat him to the tomb. John gets there, looks inside. Uh, he stays back. Peter runs inside. Both of them finally get there. They don't find a body. There's no body. All there is grave clothes. John tells us in verse 8, Peter doesn't get it, but John believes that Jesus has been raised. Even still, they walk away from that empty tomb. They don't know what to do with it. So they go home. Verse 10 tells us, they just go on back home. And that brings us right here, verse 11, to our passage. It's a passage of, of joy and hope and grace. Grace, don't you love grace? It's a beautiful display of how God works. And this morning, as we dwell on the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, that's what I want you to see. I want you to see that God works, let's say it like this, God works to balance your life in the worst weather. God is going to balance your life in the worst storm. Let's see how God does it. Let's go, I'll give you three points. Three points, very simply put. We'll give a, just a basic outline for an Easter Sunday morning sermon. Here's the first one. Number one, God works in grace. God works in grace. You see it there in verse 11. Verse 11 opens up with Mary. Notice how it's phrased in verse 11. But Mary, you feel like you're on the back end of a comparison. Something happened over here. But Mary, what is that comparison? Well, verse 10, I, I gave it to you a little bit ago. 
Verse 10 tells us that Peter and John went home and the resurrected Jesus is going to appear to this woman named Mary Magdalene, which made me want to know, what about Mary Magdalene? What can we know about Mary Magdalene? Well, a pretty good bit. Mary Magdalene is called Mary Magdalene because she's from a place called Magdala. It was a pretty good town, well-off town. She may have been a woman of means. She might have had some money. We know that early on in the story of Mary Magdalene, Jesus healed her, cast out seven demons out of Mary Magdalene. Now, the early church would pick that up, and the, and the Catholic church would pick it up and have her as a woman of ill repute. That are, there is n nothing in the Bible that says that. We just know that she was possessed by seven demons. That's all. After, after Jesus healed her and saved her, she became a committed disciple of Jesus. She follows Jesus. With other women, it, we're told that she actually supported the ministry of Jesus. We, we know that Mary Magdalene was an eyewitness. She watched as they crucified Jesus. She stayed when the men ran off. She knew where they buried Jesus. She secretly watched what tomb it would be. And chapter 20 tells us that morning she went to the tomb to finish the grueling task of getting Jesus, his body, ready for the final burial. This woman, like some of you, this woman had been through so much. Now we find her in verse 11, but Mary stands there weeping. Look at the word, weeping. Mary, she's overcome, weeping. This is not the polite crying that you might shed a tear and you can reach up and get it or, or dab your eyes or a polite sniffle if you're upset about something. I saw a young lady this week in a, in a sweatshirt, and across it, it said, I cry a lot. That's a warning or not. I cry a lot. This is not like that. This is not like that. This is, this is something different. This is the uncontrollable sobbing that happens when you lose somebody you love so desperately. You can't get it together. You can't stop crying. This is what, uh, two weeks ago, this is what happened in Nashville. This is what happened in Nashville. This is the pastor and his wife, whose little girl was at school, at their own school, their church school. And when she hears that her, when that pastor hears his nine-year-old daughter. Some of you understand the weeping going on here. It's weeping, the crying, you can't stop. It's uncontrollable crying. Let me just pause here. Let me pause and say, tears. Even tragic tears are not the end. There's, there's grace here that Mary doesn't know yet, but it's there. All of her agony, even in her agony, everything that she's been through, this woman loved Jesus so much. He had saved her, for goodness sakes. He had done what nobody else could do, and she committed her life to following him. When all the other disciples fled Mary Magdalene stood there and watched him die a gruesome death. She stood there with great feminine resolve and all the men were gone. Now, now she's, now she's come in the dark to see about his body and his body is gone. You, you can imagine the panic. She watched firsthand what those Roman soldiers did. They're brutal. What they did to Jesus on the cross. She knows their brutality. She can only imagine what they are now doing by way of desecration to his body. Verse 12 tells us that in verse 11, verse 12 tells us she now has looked inside the tomb. She stooped in, verse 11, to look inside the tomb. Verse 12, she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus used to be, one at the head, one at the foot. One sitting where Jesus' head was, one sitting where his, you know, some theologians have said, for those of you that read the Old Testament and you're familiar with the tabernacle and the Holy of Holies where uh, the Ark of the Covenant would be, 
and the mercy seat with the cherubim on either side. The mercy seat is where God would meet with his people. The high priest would go in between the two angels. Some have said there's, a loo- there's an allusion here to that. Uh, maybe so, but it's still dark there. Still dark. At least it was dark in verse 1. She hadn't been gone very long. She's back now. It's probably still dark. It's in the dark. Let me pause here and say sometimes it's in the dark. Sometimes that's where Jesus shows himself the most in the dark. That's where he works in the dark. Certainly Jesus will say he is the light of the world, and yes, he is the light of the world. He is also the Lord of the dark. Even when you feel like you're groping in the darkness, Jesus is there. You might not feel him. You may not even recognize him. Listen to what the angels, listen to their, they see this woman, the angels, they have a question for her. The angels know something Mary don't know. So verse 13, look what the angels say. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Why are you Of all the days and all of the history of the entire universe, today is the last day you ought to be crying. She didn't know that. The angels, you see, knew something that Mary didn't know. The angels knew that although Jesus was crucified on a Roman cross and put in a tomb, they knew he's alive. And if there ever was a day not to cry, today is that day, you see. When the grace of God has been completed and the doors of heaven have been opened up for anyone who wants to come in. And the angels are saying, why? Let me, let me pause here and talk just a moment about the gospel. What is it that makes us Christian? When I say gospel here, what I mean is that the Bible teaches that God is a holy God who created all of us in his image. You have great dignity. I respect you because you are made in the image of God, an image bearer. We do run into a problem, though, early on in the Bible story because we find out Adam and Eve, who are made in the image of God, have fallen into sin and have a sinful nature. That sinful nature has been passed on to all of us. We have inherited. Every one of us has it. Every one of us here is born with a sinful nature that then, with that nature, we will sin. We will do those things that are an offense to God. Because God is just, he will punish sin. You want crime punished? You understand justice? And so God is a truly just. He punishes sin. That puts us in a bit of a dilemma. Not only that, a clear condemnation. We are sinners. God is holy. He will punish sin. The gospel is interjected here. The gospel says that Jesus has come into the world as the perfect man, the God man. He does what Adam couldn't do, lives in perfect fellowship with God, maintains that fellowship, never commits a sin, never breaks God's law. He does that in our place because we can't. And then at the cross, why is the cross so important? At the cross, Jesus takes the wrath of God. You ask, do I believe in a judgmental, wrathful God? Yes. The gospel's not necessary if God is not judging. God judges sinners, but Jesus goes to the cross and receives the wrath of God for sinners. Now, we don't know if that worked or not if we don't have this story. This story is giving us the dawn of victory that will tell us anybody here, any one of you who put your faith in what Jesus has done on the cross will be saved. You see, it's a gospel of grace. What does God do? God works to balance your life in the worst weather. He does that through grace. Do you have the ballast of grace in your soul sitting you down in the water? So you can carry on. God works in grace. But let's get more specific. Let me give you a second consideration. Number two, how does God work? God, number two, God works in Christ. 
Let's talk about how God works. Very specifically, God works in Christ. Go back with me to the story. Verse 13, Mary has stooped in and looked. She sees two angels, and the angels have said, Woman, why are you crying? Mary now is having a conversation in verse 13. Woman, why are you crying? Why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord. I do not know where they have laid him. Verse 14, having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Let's just sort of mentally walk through this. The angels are talking to Mary. Mary is rattled. She's, she's pleading with the angels, tell me where the body of Jesus is. Tell me. And something happens between verse 13 and verse 14. You just keep looking at it. We don't know what happens. Here's how I would envision. She's standing outside the tomb. She's looking in the tomb and talking to angels. She don't know they're angels. She's talking to these men. And something happens behind her. Maybe she hears a noise. Maybe she saw the angels look up over her shoulder. You know how you can feel when somebody's behind you? We're not sure what happened. John Chrysostom thinks that the angels saw Jesus and looked, and, and Mary turned around to see what they were looking at. We don't know what happened. But Mary turns around, and there is Jesus. But she don't know it's Jesus. Let me pause here. How did she not know it was Jesus? This is not uncommon. Maybe it was too dark. Maybe she was crying too hard, her eyes filled with tears. Maybe it's just hysteria. But when you read the gospel stories, what we find out, this is something that happens a lot. Jesus, in some capacity, has, has changed, glorified. You find it in the gospel of Luke. The end of the, end of the gospel of Luke, the resurrected Jesus walking on the Emmaus road with those disciples that knew Jesus, and they didn't know that that was Jesus. Matthew chapter 28, when you have the Great Commission, Jesus is going to give that. The disciples are there worshiping, but some people doubted. Some didn't think it was him. Even, in this, even here in John 21, at the end, Jesus is standing on the shore. They're fishing, and Jesus speaks to them. They, they didn't recognize something about the resurrected Lord. Here in verse 14, Mary is now face-to-face -face with the resurrected Jesus, and look what she thinks. Verse 15. Look what she said. <clears throat> Jesus said to her, why, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener. The gardener. Let's pause and think for a moment about the patience. The patience of Jesus with his people patience that Jesus has had with you. There's some of you sitting here, you profess the name of Jesus, you would, would consider yourself a Christian, but it's been some times that you've been in really good fellowship, and the patience, he's not let go of you. When, when, when you don't see, or when you don't recognize his presence, look, brothers and sisters, when you don't see him or recognize his presence, he is there. When you are totally oblivious to the presence of Jesus in your life, when your life is in a panic, Jesus is there patiently getting you through to the other side. You understand that Jesus doesn't let go. Jesus doesn't walk away in frustration. Instead, Jesus, with his patience, comes this great power, this wonderful power. I want you to see the power. This story takes a beautiful turn right here as we watch God work in Christ. Join me right there in the story. Follow the story in the text, verse 14. Mary sees Jesus, but she don't know that it's Jesus. Verse 15, Jesus asks her the same thing that the angels had asked her. Join me there, verse 15. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? That's what the angels asked. And Jesus says an important phrase, whom, whom are you seeking? Let's take some nuance and let's shave it down a little bit. You understand that, that, you understand that Mary came to that gravesite looking for a what? 
She came looking for a body, a dead body. There was no reason for her to think that, that Jesus was going to be raised from the dead. She came there not to see if he was raised from the dead. She came there to do the gruesome task of taking care of a dead body. She came there looking for a what? But what she needed is a whom thing. You're looking for things, something. What are you looking for? What are you looking for? You're looking for something. And what you need is a whom. What you need is Jesus. So, so Mary, she keeps talking, verse 15. She just keeps talking. She's prattling on to the point of hysteria in verse 15. She's right at the edge of losing it, and something happened. Go, go with me to verse 15. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? So, supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him. I will take him away. Now, how's she going to do that? How's she going to carry him? She's not thinking. She's just prattling on. Verse 16, Jesus says to her, Mary. And, and she turns in this, this, uh, this Aramaic, it's, it's Rabboni, it's this loving term. Teacher. What happened there? What happened there? Just one word, with just one word. It was his voice, and more specifically, it was hearing his voice say her name. It was the voice of Jesus calling her name. Let me pause here. Remember in, uh, remember in John chapter 10 when Jesus was talking to all the, the detractors, people that did not believe in him? And in John chapter 10, verse 26 and 27, Jesus tells them, look, you don't believe. You don't believe because you're not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. His voice, you understand, his, his, his call. The call of God has the power to open people's eyes. I mean, isn't that what happened at the tomb of Lazarus about 10 chapters back from here? Isn't that what happened when Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus? Jesus stands there. Lazarus has been several days dead. And Jesus called out, Lazarus, come forth. The old preachers used to say that it, had he not said Lazarus' name, every dead body in the graveyard would have gotten up. That's the, that's the power, you see. The power was not in Lazarus making a decision. The power was in Jesus calling him. The voice. Something happened in Mary. Revelation chapter 1, written by this man named John. John tells us, Revelation 1 that Jesus, his voice is like the sound of thunder. It's like the sound of waters rolling. It's like the sound of a trumpet. Even Jesus himself would say, John chapter 5, verse 25, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. Those who hear live. Back to the story. There in verse 16, Mary, Mary is shaken from her, she's shaken from her hysteria. She recognizes it's the Lord. She runs and embraces him, which leads to my next point. Let me give you a third. I'll just give you a third point. Number three, God works in hope. God works in hope. You need the ballast of hope in your life to keep you settled in, the ballast of hope. So verse 17 Jesus has called her in verse 16. She runs and clings to him. We know that because in verse 17, Jesus says, let go. Mary is understandably ecstatic to have Jesus back. She, she didn't expect this. She knew what happened with Lazarus, but this is different than what happened with Lazarus. Lazarus was raised from the dead. Lazarus will die again. This is not like what happened to Lazarus. Things are not going back to the way they were. It's what verse 7, it's what Jesus says. Verse 17, let me read it to you. Verse 17. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me. Evidently, when she found out, she's ran. Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. 
But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Now, I want you to slow down on verse 17 and circle it in your Bible. And I want you to hear what Jesus says to Mary and to the disciples, he give, which is remarkable. He gives this woman a message to take to the disciples. Listen to the message. Verse 17. Do not cling to me. I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. Here, the Gospel of John, 108 times in the Gospel of John, Jesus refers to God as Father, 108 times. 71 times in the Gospel of John, Jesus refers to God as the Father. 21 times in the Gospel of John, Jesus refers to God as my Father. But not once has he ever called God the disciples' Father. Never until now. Now he tells Mary, Mary, I want you to go and tell my brothers. I am ascending to my father, but now he's also your father. My God, now he's also your God. And do you see that through the work of Jesus, do you see that through the work of Jesus on the cross, his redeeming blood, his resurrection, that's Christianity. Christianity is not you doing something. Christianity is Jesus dying on the cross in your place, God raising him from the dead in victorious resurrection, and you believing that that applies to you. Through the cross, through the cross, this new relationship is made possible. Through the cross of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus, God no longer holds us in contempt God no longer sees you as a rebel that breaks the law. Now God in Christ adopts us as his own sons and daughters. This is what Ephesians 1 says. Ephesians 1 says that he has predestined us for adoption to himself through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. It's what he wanted to do. Or Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 15, that in Christ, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into sin, into fear. You have received the spirit of adoption by which you and I cry out, Abba, Father. It's the story, brothers and sisters. This is the story of God's grace. This is the story of hope. This is God's grace on full display at the resurrection. This is why we worship on Sundays. This is why we baptize in the name of Jesus. This is why we have the Lord's Supper. It's why up, up on top of that baptistry there, why there's a cross there. Why do we put that on display? Because Jesus Christ died in the place of sinners, satisfying the anger of God God raised him from the dead and he offers his love and forgiveness to anyone here who will confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. If you do, you will be saved by God's grace alone through your faith alone in Christ alone. That's how God works. God works to balance your life in the worst of storms. He works in grace. He works in Christ. And he works in hope. Will you come and give your life to the crucified, resurrected Jesus? You walk out of here with something that has you settled, balanced, and ready for whatever awaits you. This morning, as we close together, I want you to close with me in a word of prayer. With your heads bowed this morning, we're going to sing another song. It's a great song, a worship song. When we sing this last song, I want you to sing to, at the top of your voice. 
as loud as you can and worship to the Lord. Others of you, you need to make sure you know the Lord. This song is an invitation, an invitation for you to give your life to Jesus Christ. There'll be pastors here down the very front. If you want to come and talk to one of the pastors about what it means to have the ballast of the gospel put in your life, you come forward and let's talk about what it means to give your life to Jesus. There are some of you here. You need somebody here. You, 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 you want to pray for somebody. You invited and invited and invited and it didn't come. You want to come and pray for that person today? Why don't you come when we sing? This is a, a great long song. You've got plenty of time to come and do that. Maybe you just want to come. You've been wandering in the desert and you think, you know what? I'm a child of God. I've been adopted by God's grace. This is where I should be with this family. God has spoken to your heart through the preached word and the sung word today. We invite you to come forward. Father, thank you. Thank you for the grace you give us in Jesus. Thank you for the joy of being a child of God. Thank you for bringing us from death to life. Hear our songs. Lord, hear our prayers and our song as we lift our voices to you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand please as we sing together?